This is Macro Voices with hedge fund manager Eric Townsend, the free weekly financial podcast targeting professional finance, high net worth individuals, family offices, and other sophisticated investors. Macro Voices is all about the brightest minds in the world of finance and macroeconomics telling it like it is, bullish or bearish, no holds barred. Now, here are your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna. Eric, it was great to have Jim back on the show and get an update on uh, what his thought process is. Anything that you took away from the interview? Well, everything, really. I I really enjoy talking to Jim. He's one of my favorite guests that we have on the show. And uh, I I really am in strong agreement with just about everything that he said. I want to get into more detail on some of those topics, though. So let's get into our post-game chart book. Listeners, you'll find the download link in your research roundup email. It says Big Picture Trading Chart Book. Patrick, Let's go ahead and uh, hit it here with page two. We're looking at S&P 500 futures. Why this chart and what are these yellow lines showing us? Well, all I really just wanted to do was do an update from uh, the last chart book we had, just showing that we were looking at the time at the overhead resistance levels, uh, uh, just above that 3,200 level. And the market really has just gone right through that and continues to crawl higher toward the next major resistance level, which is its uh, previous highs. Now, will we see an all-time high? I I think a lot of it has to do with uh, where the leadership comes from on the market. I mean, uh, we certainly saw um, very very strong reaction on earnings on a number of uh, these uh, different FANG stocks. And uh, if that creates a tailwind pushing the NASDAQ to all-time highs, it would be very hard for the S&P not to be dragged higher with all of that as the these, those market cap behemoths finish off some of these bigger moves. But it is um, the S&P is a very distinct uptrend. And one pattern that we've seen, even when I break it down uh, to more intraday charts, is every dip is so far being bought. And it's a very systematic process higher and we haven't seen the technical break or the damage that are the warning signs I typically look for for a turn and doesn't mean it can't emerge in the coming weeks but at least at this moment the market has been pretty systematically behaving in its upward trajectory. Now Patrick there's a very well-known pattern called a double top and technical analysis. Do you see reason to think that this is about to be a double top and maybe you know it's it's time to sell here or is that not really called for with what you're seeing in the charts? You know, the interesting part is is that it's all about, I think, the way that the NASDAQ and those FANG stocks trade, because right now the NASDAQ looks incredibly bullish, and those breakouts that we've seen on a number of those stocks like Apple and Amazon really continue to show that the trend may continue. And if that's the case, it's going to be hard for any of these other uh, major U.S. indices not to get some sort of a tailwind from that that can push it higher if we still see a little bit more on the upside there. But what is interesting is that we're getting a lot of divergences in a lot of the other developed markets, you know, especially European equities just don't seem to be participating at all. And so really, this continues to be a U.S. driven rally. And some of the Periphery markets like uh, the Kospi out in uh, South Korea continues to get a lot of that uh, tailwind from a lot of the semiconductor kind of stocks that have been working so well in this environment. I mean, there is a chance we're going to see a double top, but at least at this moment, I think the most immediate thing that we want to watch is are we going to A, approach it, and two, does the NASDAQ break out? I mean, I think the, those are two very important things to watch uh, that will answer that question. Let's go ahead and move on to the U.S. dollar index on page three. Boy, look at that support level at 96 that really held so reliably, going back almost 18 months. And all of a sudden, once we took it out, boy, look out below. What's your take, Patrick, on what comes next here? Uh, are we going to see a, a bottom here at 92 and a half, or are we you know, still headed back down to 89, which looks like the previous low? Well, on the daily charts, there are some short-term measured moves that are finishing right around this 93 level, more or less, which means that there could be some short-term stall in the selling. But the breakdown here is pretty distinct. And one of the reasons I really just wanted to capture in this chart was just to show the rise and the fall of the dollar from 2016 to 2018. And, you know, for a lot of the people that are ready to put the nails in the coffin on the dollar, I mean, it, it wasn't that long ago 
that we saw a, a pretty significant drop in the dollar and it didn't really change anything. And so while there's no denying that there's a very distinct downtrend on the most immediate short term, and that may very well even drop a few more handles on the downside during the selling. But I don't know whether I'm ready to write off the dollar just yet. I think that uh, once the selling subsides, we'll see where uh, where everything comes down. But certainly this dollar selling has been the fuel that has driven a lot of the commodity bull market, and particularly the movement we're seeing in gold and silver over the last little while. So, though, Eric, let's move on to chart four, where we have the crude oil chart. And really, this is where, uh, you know, I wanted your take on this as well. Like, I was anticipating that at, at minimum, we should have seen some backfilling, stalling of the price action, something that bring it into the mid 30s to create an, uh, a buy on dip opportunity. But it's it seems like the tight trade range we've seen in oil is almost uh, unreal. It's just so it's almost boring to watch oil over the last little while. But, you know, it was sort of boring watching gold around 1800 until it exploded. I mean, do you think that this really has the potential for a leg higher into that fourth quarter? Patrick, that's an excellent analogy, just as gold surprised us by consolidating longer than we thought and then really took off. You know, what I see here, the the V-shaped recovery off of the panic bottoms was very predictable, went higher than I thought, above $40, I thought we were going to get a meaningful downside retrace. Let's say back down to 25 or $26. That would be uh, about the right level to be, you know, a 50 or a 61.8% FIB retrace. And then we go up from there and see the typical kind of volatility that you'd expect. I think what's going on here is uh, people see what Art Berman sees and they know it's not time yet, but they know that eventually U.S. production really is going to fall off a cliff as a result of the damage that's been done to the economy. And that's going to push prices higher eventually, not yet. And I really thought we would see some downside. Uh, You know, if you look at a seasonality perspective on this, August tends to be the highest month. And it's usually right around the first week of September that the market tops out and then it sells off through September and October. And eventually it's in the winter sometime that the price bottoms or or early winter. Um, You know, does seasonality really even matter if seasonality is driven mostly by the consumption that occurs in summer driving season? And we haven't really had a summer driving season because of the crisis? Or maybe we're done consolidating and it's up from here. But the two potential options that I see, number one, we got the rally up to $41, $42, whatever it was, consolidate and then straight up from there. The other is a a bit of a downside correction before the big move up, which might not start until the middle of Q4. It's looking more and more like this market is just looking for an excuse to move higher. So maybe we're just going to consolidate sideways until that move higher begins. I've started buying the the short-term dips as opposed to waiting for a really big dip. You know, we we may have to weather some, some volatility if I get surprised and there's a big move downside. But I was thinking before I'm going to wait for $30 before I start buying. No, I'm not going to do that. High 30s feels like a good number to buy at at this point. Well, you know, uh, an interesting note is, is that natural gas is actually broken out. And because of the steep contango in the curve, it as we get into the seasonality of the winter, uh, we're going to roll up the term structure of that uh, of that contango. It's going to drive some higher prices there. But what's also interesting is that all the um, oil and gas stocks, the energy companies that trade on the exchanges, all of them have actually been going through a quite a substantial correction over the last two, three months. In fact, we've seen many of them doing full 50 plus percent retracements of their prior rises. And so it's interesting that we didn't see the correction in oil, but we certainly have seen them in energy companies. And it would be really interesting if oil broke out, whether that proved to being a a buying opportunity on many of these energy companies that have already consolidated so much. Anyway, moving on to chart five, I have here the 10-year treasury yield. And really, I don't think we have anything more to really add than what we talked about. But it's pretty interesting that the the yield, and it doesn't matter the commodities are rising and even some a little bit of inflation 
inflation fears are, uh, are popping up as a weak dollar tends to do that. But it doesn't seem to be at all a concern for the Treasury bond market as the yields continue to edge lower, almost like this, uh, this recession that we're in is just such a powerful deflationary impulse that maybe the bond market just doesn't believe that this is enough to drive inflation. I don't know. Do you have any other insights on that? Well, I think we've got to put this in perspective. You don't see it on this chart, but <laughs> that same approximate downslope that you see from you know high left to, to low right on this chart, that doesn't just go back the two years or year and a half that you've got shown in this chart. It goes back 30 years to the early 80s. You know, we're at 15 or 16 percent returns on on treasury bonds. So, you know, from a big picture standpoint, you're down to 53 basis points for all intents and purposes. You've hit, you know, approximately zero. You've gone all the way from high interest rates to zero interest rate. So either that means that, okay, that's it. It's over. We, we, We got all the way to zero. You can't go any further. Or we're pausing here because people think you can't go any further. And it turns out that despite what a lot of experts have said, yes, the world's reserve currency sovereign issues really can go negative in their 10 year issue. Uh, You know, a lot of people think that's completely impossible because the U S dollar is the world's global reserve currency. Well, a lot of people thought it was impossible for the German Bund to go negative on the 10 year maturity. And they were right for a while until they got proven wrong. And then they got proven a lot more wrong. So are we headed to negative U S treasury yields or is there really a, a lower boundary at zero that has to be respected? That's the question on my mind. I already asked Jim Bianco today. I'll continue asking our other guests in future programs. All right. So uh, moving on to chart six, I have a chart here of Tesla. Oh, no, no. Sorry. That's gold. Uh, that was, but <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so when we're looking here on gold, I mean, it's really over the last year, it appears that we're almost getting into a parabolic phase of this rise as as gold is going up. And what's particularly interesting is is when we look at the bear market of gold, the one that lasted from 2011 through uh, all the way to 2000, arguably to 2016 was where the real low was. But we had this long extended basing formation on gold. And really this breakout on the upside has now, based on the the measured techniques that I use, uh, was only targeting the initial impulse up to about 2200 on the upside. So it's like we're at this stage where gold is accelerated and has broken to all time highs and is doing so in this almost parabolic fashion. And and while I remain much bigger picture bullish gold, the big question mark for me is, is that uh, are we about to at least hit some intermediate high that is going to, to kind of pause gold? And, or are we going to go into like some big extended move that could print 2,500 plus in this impulse? And it's one of the bigger pieces. But to me, this is uh, pretty much already a very mature breakout. I'll explain it further when we get to the silver charts here in a moment. But did you have anything that you wanted to add on this gold chart before we move on? Well, it really is an extension of the same thing that I've been saying since 1350 or so. And I know a lot of our listeners are sick of hearing me say it, but a healthy bull market is one that has its share of healthy corrections. And the reason those corrections are so important is they shake out the weak hands. We have a market now that's full of weak hands that have made a lot of money and have added to their positions higher and higher. And you you end up with a situation where if the market starts going down significantly, there's a whole bunch of inexperienced investors who are going to panic and sell, and that's going to accelerate the downside. So there's a lot of risk resulting from this. I'm reminded of an interview I heard with Jim Rogers at least a decade ago. And this was the last time that gold was really taking off, you know, in the 2010, 2011 timeframe. And the interviewer says to Jim Rogers, you know, and he's obviously very excited and very optimistic about gold. He said, Jim, do, do, do you think that gold could, could move up even another hundred dollars from here in the next few weeks? And Jim said, God, I hope not. I'd have to sell it if it did that. And that really is what comes to mind here. We're getting to a point where this is looking more and more like a blow off top. And I know I've been saying that for a long time and it hasn't happened. But at some point, if you get this much upside this quickly, 
There has to be a natural correction. So I hope that we don't get a move from here, that we're not looking at twenty-three or $2,400 gold prices in the next two or three weeks, because that's a, a almost sure sign of a blow-off top. What I'd much rather see is a consolidation or a correction back down to 1800 retesting the previous breakout zone as support, and then moving higher. That's what a bull market that's healthy looks like. What we're seeing here are more and more signs of a blow-off top setting up. Right. And so it, what I want to do, though, is, is actually overlay our show how the chart on silver looks. And during that same cycle that we just showed on gold, where the original silver bull market from, at least on this chart, uh, advanced in 2009 through 2011, that kind of blow off on the parabolic rise of silver. And that period from 2015 through to 2020, where silver just traded sideways in almost a purgatory for five years before we just broke out over the last uh, month or more. And this seems like a very early stage breakout, which is that like it's just begun. And yet on gold, we're talking about that it seems like it's almost blowing off. And uh, which one is going to prevail? And I wanted to use this opportunity to kind of reflect on the last major extended bull market of silver. And so on page eight, I wanted to capture that entire 2000 to 2011 bull advance in silver where we went you know from four or five dollars to fifty dollars a thousand percent rise over a decade which was a, a very healthy time to have owned silver and just buying and holding it throughout that entire period what looks like a, a chart at least at first glance that kind of starts on the bottom left and ends on the top right i circled here a number of these advances in silver the particularly 2004, 2006, and, and 2008 advances that I wanted to zoom in and really demonstrate the behavior you just described, which is you were saying earlier that, you know, what's healthy in a bull market is that the, the rise is checked and that there's, there's, the, there's these kind of pullbacks along the way. And so uh, looking on page nine was the first and legitimate breakout of silver in 2004. Now, prior in 2001 through 2003, gold was already rallying those three years and advancing. And very similar to what we witnessed in the last few years, silver just didn't participate. Silver was just dogging it in a sideways range. And then in mid-2003, we saw the breakout in silver in what was a very distinct, almost parabolic rise, very much echoing the type of advance we've seen today, that saw silver pretty much run almost double. It basically went from like 4 to $8. And in the process of doubling, everyone was so sure that that was a great bull market, and it was, but it didn't stop in 2004 from that blow off top, seeing it give back 30% of that entire rise. And we saw it pull back from $8 back down toward five and a half. And this is, a, I think, a very good example of what we may very well experience, particularly in silver, which is incredibly volatile. It doesn't mean that the, or the gold and silver bulls that say over the next decade, the MMT and, and all the policies and all the debt and everything will cause inflation and gold and silver will continue to rise over the next decade. I'll agree with that. But the thing is, is that that didn't change the fact that there's going to be these corrections along the way. And I think that this is a very good example of what could potentially happen. Well, Patrick, I couldn't agree more. And I think the, the big challenge we have, as you say, is the fundamentals are so good, so incredibly good, because it's so clear to so many people that we're headed toward a major debasement of fiat currency uh, just uh, around the world. The, the fundamentals are so good for gold that it just can't seem to stop. And the problem any time that happens is, is you, the, you know, the more it goes up quickly without any significant consolidation or corrections, the more that you get weak hands into the market that are eventually going to be the source of panic selling when things do turn around for whatever reason. So I really hope that we get a 30% correction in gold. We're overdue for one, and uh, that would really make me a lot more comfortable about buying more of it. I couldn't be more excited about the long-term fundamentals, but just you know, look at how far we've moved, how quickly here. 
So Eric, what I wanted to then do is just continue on and, and demonstrate the same characteristic over again on pages 10 and 11. And so while again, that bull market, decade long bull market was well underway, that saw a thousand percent rise in silver over that decade. Back in 2005 through 2006, silver did the same thing. It began around six, seven dollars and proceeded to double going up toward $14 an ounce. And again, another parabolic rise that followed just a few years after that 2004 rise. And again, the same pattern happened. It blew off a top and dropped 30%. And then when we look on page 11, this time it did again a, a similar scenario where in 2007 into 2008, we saw it almost double going from you know, $11 to 21 in a span of, of just about a half a year to create that top that occurred in early 2008. And this time the correction was much deeper, probably exacerbated by the financial crisis and the liquidity event that caused probably the correction to be much deeper than it probably should have been. But there, silver dropped 50% of its value. It went from 20 back down to just under 10. And that ended up being also a compelling buying opportunity. But very similar, just echoing exactly what we've been talking about, that this bull market probably will last a decade or more into the future. But along the way, there are these corrections. And whenever we get to these short-term periods where the impulse higher is going parabolic this way, it is often that these types of mean reverting corrections happen. And this is where you know our listeners need to kind of taper their short-term enthusiasm on how much more there is on the upside. It doesn't, to me, feel very asymmetric at this moment to be going into new positioning on gold and silver. And in fact, this is a, a, a stage where one of my favorite option strategies of collaring in on gold and silver becomes a, a, one of the most important tools in a toolbox on how to manage this. Because uh, it, one, it, one of the biggest advantages in gold and silver is that they don't have a fat left tail skew on their options chains. And so it's really easy to build these amazing option collars on gold and silver and continue to have further upside on them and yet locking in the gains as you're going allow you the conviction to stay with your positions, but yet at the same time know that you're not going to give back a chunk of your profits by holding too long. And so that's a very healthy alternative to the, the idea of selling your long-term holdings in gold and silver. And that's currently what we're doing with our members at Big Picture Trading. Patrick, the caller strategy is a really powerful one, but I think there's another side of this we need to talk about it. We don't have time this week, so maybe we can come back to it in next week's postgame segment. And that is for people who, who just you know can't bear to, to not get involved here, uh, maybe they didn't have enough gold or they, they didn't have any gold and they, they, they feel like they've missed out and they want to get in on this market. I think there's probably a, a strong argument for using an options-based strategy, at least initially, because as you you say there is all of that significant downside if you buy calls on gold here you participate in the upside but you, you can't lose any more than you spent on the calls and boy we've come up an awful long way awful quickly uh, i'd also like to talk to you about some other aspects of this in terms of how much gold is too much gold should we think about gold as a currency or we should we think of it as a speculative investment and so forth let's come back to that in next week's postgame segment meanwhile folks if you want to see patrick actually putting on these collar trades on gold and silver just go to bigpicturetrading.com check the information on page 12 sign up for your free 14-day trial of big picture trading and uh, you're going to have any gold and silver collar trades coming up in the next 14 days patrick Oh, absolutely. We're already uh, positioning. We've been long gold and silver the entire ride up, and our priority here is how to keep the gains we've made, and that's, uh, that's going to be what uh, we're going to be covering in the next couple of weeks for sure. So keep the opportunity to participate in more upside while still locking in the gains that you've already got. That concludes this edition of Macro Voices. Be sure to tune in each week to hear feature interviews with the brightest minds in finance and macroeconomics. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com. 
the Internet's premier source of online education for traders. Please visit BigPictureTrading.com for more information. Please register your free account at MacroVoices.com. Once registered, you'll receive our free weekly research roundup email containing links to supporting documents from our featured guests and the very best free financial content our volunteer research team could find on the Internet each week. You'll also gain access to our free listener discussion forums and research library. And the more registered users we have, the more we'll be able to recruit high-profile feature interview guests for future programs. So please register your free account today at MacroVoices.com if you haven't already. You can subscribe to Macro Voices on iTunes to have Macro Voices automatically delivered to your mobile device each week free of charge. You can email questions for the program to mailbag at macrovoices.com and we'll answer your questions on the air from time to time in our mailbag segment. Macro Voices is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only. The information presented on Macro Voices should not be construed as investment advice. Always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. The views and opinions expressed on Macro Voices are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's hosts or sponsors. Macro Voices, its producers, sponsors, and hosts Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna shall not be liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based on information or viewpoints presented on Macro Voices. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com and by funding from Fourth Turning Capital Management, LLC. For more information, visit MacroVoices.com.